And I'm Dave Amenheiser. I'm the president. Of, I have the privilege of being the president of the Council of Homeowners Associations. I want to thank our two candidates for joining us tonight, John Crookshank and Alex Villanueva, for the uh, county supervisor debate for the 4th District. So let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance and John Manny Attackus as our past as our uh, past uh, president emeritus, if you could uh, start us out with the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. So uh, just a couple things. Uh, CHOA, for those of you that don't know us, is an association of the homeowners associations, the 60 here in Rancho Palos Verdes. And it's a 40-year-old organization dedicated to putting on forums like this in, in good government. So we're, we're excited about having you all tonight. Uh, and so thank you for, uh, for joining us. We're a volunteer organization, and so all the hard work that goes on to putting on, putting on an event like this is, uh, I hope that's not my phone, I thought I turned it off, uh, is, uh, is it due to our volunteers and our board, and I was wondering if our board members could stand up, or if they're already standing up, stick their arms up, and uh, let's give a round of applause for this group. It's a great organization. I, I have, uh, I have a couple of people to thank, but foremost, Steve Peristam, who uh, uh, came up with this idea originally. Steve, raise your hand so everybody knows who to thank you. And he has provided us with the fun facts about LA County. Did you know? And just, just so that you'll have some idea of what the stakes are in the coming elections. Uh, LA County, uh, 4,000 square miles includes 88 cities and 120 unincorporated communities. LA County has 10 million residents, and our county is more populous than 40 individual states. The size of LA County, it's the largest county government in the United States, has a budget of nearly $47 billion with a B, and that budget is larger than 25 states. It has 115,000 employees. And each district, there are five districts, each district, like the fourth, represents over 2 million people. And that give you some idea, that's um, three or four times larger than most congressional districts. The, uh, the county provides the following services to its residents, uh, public health services, uh, certainly uh, safety, uh, it uh, controls the prosecutors, the public defenders, the probation, and the county jails. Uh, it manages the region's uh, flood control system, the dams, the reservoirs, the underground storm drains, and maintains a network of libraries, museums, parks, and beaches. In the unincorporated areas of our county, it provides the fire and, and, uh, and uh, paramedic services, certainly the sheriff's department, road maintenance, animal control, water and trash collection, and uh, uh, local and, and business licenses. Just to give you an idea of, of the kinds of things that LA County and its board of supervisors are, are involved with. So a few fun th facts, uh, but let me move on. Uh, let me introduce uh, Glenn Cornell. Glenn is going to be our moderator this evening, and he's an attorney. He's uh, been part of the California Bar since 1973, a graduate of Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania, uh, went to graduate school at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and is a graduate of the Stanford Law School. He first moved to Southern California in 1974, and I think it took you a few years, Glenn, to figure out that uh, down here on the peninsula was God's country in, in, in L.A. County, and so he moved down here in 1994. Uh, as past president for numerous terms of the Rolling Hills Riviera Homeowners Association and can, uh, continues as their treasurer. 
uh, one, one of the things Glenn has done for his community and our community is, uh, those of you are maybe familiar with the Ponte Vista development over on Western Avenue, the original proposal was for 2,400 units over there, and uh, uh, Glenn and, and his neighbors were able to work to pare that down to, to 700. And so uh, please join me in, in welcoming uh, Glenn Cornell as our moderator. Thank you, Dave. Well, this is going to be a debate, debate format where candidates state their qualifications and viewpoints on various issues of interest to LA County residents, and particularly those residents of the fourth supervisor district. Civil exchanges between candidates are not only encouraged, but we're counting on you doing it. And uh, just so that um, the audience understands the format that we're going to be working with. Each candidate will be given a three-minute three period of time to, uh, to uh, introduce themselves and make some introductory remarks. Uh, the first one who's going to, to talk, because we had a coin toss before you arrived, was, uh, is Mr. Villanueva. Uh, and then uh, after that, we're going to take questions. Uh, we were originally concerned that there wouldn't be that many questions, but we have so many that we may have to have a second, third, or fourth meeting within the stack that we've generated. But each candidate will be given two, two minutes, two minutes to uh, answer the, uh, uh, to address each question, um, and then at the. Uh, we hope to be done by 8:30, and the, uh, each candidate will be given three minutes to make closing remarks. Um, members of the audience may continue to ask questions, but we ask that you do it in written format. People will be circulating around. If you think of something, please give the, uh, the question to them, and, uh, and then they'll bring it up here. As I just alluded, we thought originally there would be a problem with too few questions. We may not be able to get to your question tonight in the time that we have allowed, so if we don't, my, apologize, uh, or my apologies, and uh, hopefully maybe we'll do this again and, and we will get to it. Uh, your name will not be used. If you, if you attach your name to the question, it won't be uh, mentioned here tonight. And another thing I should mention, we anticipate, and we've already seen, that a number of questions are going to be quite similar. For example, like on homelessness. So you may not hear your question phrased exactly as you phrased it, but you'll very likely hear it asked in one form or another here tonight. A couple other things that, we'd, that we would ask is that no clapping, hissing, or, 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 or whatnot during, during this. I hope the candidates will agree to stay behind afterward, and if you have questions to ask them uh, at that time, uh, perhaps you can, uh, can do it. And um, let's see if there's anything else I want to. Oh, and please, let's just keep the uncivil remarks uh, to yourself for tonight. We appreciate these men coming here and talking with us. It's a great opportunity for prospective voters to see where they stand on certain issues that have terrific bearing on us. So let's be good hosts. Thank you. Now, with that, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Villanueva to, to uh, give us uh, uh, an overview of uh, his background and why he's running. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. And yeah, oh, wait a minute. That's even better. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, for coming. Thank you, the organization, the Homeowners Association, for bringing us together. And first, I want to comment the fact that there should be a third chair here. And everything that we're going to talk about is going to be direct, obviously, for what the incumbent is and is not doing here. And that was, is why probably we're both running. And there's serious issues that need to be resolved. But first, let me introduce who I am and why I'm here. I'm Alex Villanueva. I'm the former sheriff of Los Angeles County. I'm a resident of La Habra Heights. In fact, this is the furthest you can get in one corner of the fourth district. I'm on the opposite furthest you can get on the other corner of the district. So there's a lot of real estate in between us. There's 2 million residents and uh, 400 plus square miles, 31 uh, cities, and then uh, scores of uh, unincorporated communities. And there's a lot of need. 
We have huge things that we need to resolve. We have the homeless crisis. We have a crime spiraling out of control. We have public corruption that rears its ugly head again and again. And we have the same response from our elected leaders, the same, you know, let's just keep doing what we're doing. We're going to hope for a different result. Now we're done with it. I hopefully the year 2024 is a year that everybody says, you know what, we're done with career politicians who just want to stay in office and don't want to fix the things that need to be fixed. And there's a lot that needs to be fixed. I was born and raised on the East Coast and born in Chicago, raised in upstate New York, Rochester. Then my family moved to Puerto Rico. So I spent my youth on the island, learned Spanish, went to college there, then joined the Air Force, wound up at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino. So I was active duty Air Force and I was Air National Guard, then the Army National Guard. During that time, I joined the Sheriff's Department back in 1986. I signed up during the summer of 85 when the Night Stalker was running around causing havoc. And I, I served 32 years with the Sheriff's Department, retired in, eight, in, uh, in 2018, and then I became the sheriff in the fall of 2018. I went to San Bernardino Valley College, got an associate's degree. Then I went to, um, it was called in those days, Excelsior College, Regents College, and I got a bachelor's degree in, in liberal studies. And I went to Cal State Northridge, got a master's in public administration. I finally went to University of Laverne. I got a doctorate in public administration. So my experience on the department, both in the, as an appointed deputy, worked my way up to the ranks to lieutenant, and then as a, ultimately as a sheriff, has given me a lot of experience, lived experience, seeing how government works, where it fails, where it works best, what impact we can have, and the role, the proper role of government in the public sphere, what government should be doing, should not be doing. And I think we're at the point now where we have a good idea where to go forward. And I look forward to having a good debate and leave it up to you, John. Well, thank you, Alex. And Alex and I met a few months ago and he's been nothing but a gentleman to me. So thank you very much. So my name is John Crookshank. Many of you know me. I'm the current mayor in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. I want to thank the uh, Council of Homeowners Association here, CHOA. And also I want to thank the residents for being here. I knew that there would be a big crowd because as Mr. Villanueva just mentioned, the role of a supervisor is hugely important and we found that out during COVID. My time's not up. <laughs> That was quick. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Vote for me. So a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a third generation Los Angeles County resident. I actually grew up in the city of El Segundo. I was fortunate enough to have two amazing parents. My mom actually was on the school board for nine years. And that's probably where I got the bug uh, for public service. Although I didn't actually seek public service until I was 50 years old. In 2017, I ran for the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council. At that time, there were a couple open seats. And anyone that's lived in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes knows that this is a special place. And when you become a city council member here, it's incumbent upon that you listen to people. Because there's so many smart people, not just here, but all throughout LA County. And so my job as a city council member has been fairly easy because I listen to smart people and I take good advice. And all of us should be using our ears and our mouths pr proportionally. I've been married to my wife, Jennifer. It'll be 31 years this year. I have one son, his name is Sean. He recently graduated from ASU. So I have a very small family and I've lived in Rancho Palos Verdes since 2004. Before that, I started my civil engineering company in Los Angeles. It's in the city of San Pedro, so it's just right down the hill. And I find that being an engineer and being an elected official, I'm able to use my problem solving skills to be able to really help people with the big issues. The reason I'm running is because the current board of supervisors are not solving our problems. Things keep getting worse and we all know that. And that's why there's so many people here tonight because you all know that. I call them my core four issues, homelessness, public safety, infrastructure, and economic empowerment. And all four of those need to be solved. And when I become a supervisor, that's what I'm gonna work on. So I appreciate everyone being here tonight and I look forward to a lively and great discussion with you all. Thank you. Okay. 
first question is going to be one that's general, but I suspect it's on all our minds, and John has already alluded to it somewhat, and that is, what do you think is the most important issue facing Los Angeles County, and what plan do you have to address it? And John, I think you're going to lean off. Okay. I mentioned four issues, but I think right now the most important issue of all is public safety. I find that too many of us, our businesses and our residents feel like they're under assault with crime. Crime is different in all of our communities. Right now we've got smash and grabs, we've got break-ins, burglaries happening here on the peninsula. But in other parts of our city, you have many other different types of crimes. And we, we currently have a district attorney that I do not support that is allowing our criminals to have more rights than our victims. And that's not right. And so we need supervisors that are actually gonna push back against that sort of wrong, soft on crime mentality. And we don't have that right now with our supervisors. So for me, I believe our supervisors should take our resources. We should be making sure that we make crime illegal again, that we lock up the criminals that need to be locked up. We can't be soft on crime at this point. We've tried it and it doesn't work. We know what works. We know that when people are incarcerated that are real criminals, it's a true deterrent. And so for me, as a supervisor, I'm gonna make sure that our sheriffs have the support they need. There's, they're 1,200 short right now, and that's not fair to them or to any of us. They need the backing of the Board of Supervisors, and I'm gonna provide that. Well, I will say that homelessness and crime, they're so intertwined, the two, that it's really hard to separate which one takes precedent over the other. But uh, since you elaborate on crime, I'm going to elaborate a bit on homelessness. And first, I want to acknowledge my lovely wife in the audience, Vivian. <laughs> she served for the department for 24 years as a deputy sheriff. And I want to acknowledge the other the deputies in the room right there, if you two could stand up. Everybody, let's give them a round of applause. We need a lot more like them. When I took office in 2018, our homeless outreach service team had four deputies and a lieutenant. That was it. And that was not cutting it for a county of 10 million. So I upped the ante and added 22 more deputies, uh, two more sergeants, and another lieutenant. And that was a team that you saw fan out and went to Venice, went to San Vicente, where the veterans were homeless on the street there on, on front of the Veterans Administration, uh, cleared up Larios Park, uh, Placito Olvera, all those places they went, we showed that we can actually solve homelessness. We can get people off the streets, into housing, clean up the neighborhood, and give it back to the community. It can be done. We created a model that did not use force, we did not use arrest, but boy, were those deputies persuasive with what they did, and they did it humanely. And they it is a group effort and a collaboration with the Department of Mental Health, uh, Public Works, Veterans Affairs, you name it, we all work together. It was successful. So the question is, why did not the city and the county replicate what we did? In 2021, I called for an emergency declaration on homelessness. I wrote to the Board of Supervisors that we need to declare an emergency. I wrote to the governor. Both of them said, ah, never mind, it's not important. They said, no, we have robust plans in place. Turns out, no, their plan was to repeat the same thing, spend more billions on a failed plan. We can do far better than that. Well, I know those, both of those topics are going to be subjects of many questions this evening. But I'd like to just follow up with one question about crime, and that is one of the things that we've been reading regards, uh, it concerns Proposition 47, which was passed some years ago, and it seems to be one of the things that people are pointing at and implying that it has something to do with the upsurge in crime. So I'm going to ask uh, each of you to address this, and that is, are there any parts of Proposition 47 that you think have worked and that should be kept or just tweaked? And are there, though, are there other portions that you think should be eliminated or modified to a, a substantial uh, extent? Well, I'll tell you this, Prop 47 needs to be repealed in its entirety. 
you cannot be, you know, there's old saying, you can't make chicken, you know what, out of chicken, you know what, well, that applies there. See, I'm keeping it G-rated. The uh, Prop 47 in two big categories has failed miserably. They decriminalize a lot of the uh, narcotics laws. Those narcotics laws are what we could use in law enforcement to get a drug addict off the street, cleaned up, in jail, into court, and then into a treatment facility to avoid a felony conviction. Once they removed the stick, we lost the stick and the carrot. All those treatment centers went out of business, and now the only treatment they get is when they're dead because of fentanyl overdose. That is one of the profound impacts of Prop 47. The other side is on the property crimes. They literally decriminalize theft because they create all these felony categories became misdemeanors. There was a, a crime called petty theft with a prior, 666 of the penal code. You did one shoplifting, the second shoplift, you were caught. All we had to look at your record to see you had a prior shoplifting. You got the felony, you went to jail. You did not go out to go and smash and grab and do another theft the same day. That worked. And all of that was done away with Prop 47. It had a fancy title for Safer California, some nonsense like that. It was a horrible experiment with a very, very bad outcome. We need to repeal this in entirety. And then let's go back to establishing law and order. Oh, my God, who would have thought? Just today, my wife was at the, at the CVS in La Habra, and she just missed a robbery that had just walked out before her. That's how frequent things are. And I can tell you this, it is not discriminatory to enforce the rule of law. It works. Uh, there's not anything on Prop 47 that I like. Um, and the problem is that it's a law that's now in Sacramento where we have even just the crime and safety subcommittee nothing gets out of that committee that's going to help us repeal 47. So it's going to have to go back to the people, unfortunately. At this point, we're, hope, we're hoping to get any type of tweaks because the other part is you have these repeat offenders and they just, it's a revolving door and our businesses are under assault. And as a business owner, it's hard enough to do business in California. It's so difficult. And I don't, even run a convenience store or something where the public enters. I run an engineering company. I can only imagine being a restaurant or a small business that's just selling something on Main Street. Our businesses are under assault, and our county supervisors are doing nothing about it. When Prop 47 was occurring, I believe most of them supported it. And you've seen nothing but crickets now that we've seen that it's a failed experience, just like Mr. Villanueva just mentioned. And that's the problem with our supervisors now, is they're not doing anything to solve the problems. They're not fighting for us. Our businesses are leaving. We talked about the 10 million population. We're not at 10 million anymore. We're losing about 1% of our population every year right here in LA County. And the only reason you would leave LA County or beautiful California is because of our politicians, period. And until people wake up, and start voting the incumbents out and start making a real change, you're gonna get what you're allowing. And that's why both him and I are here tonight because we know that what's going on now has failed. We need to start voting different now. Thank you. I'm gonna switch gears slightly and ask a question about homelessness. And that is, are there any programs that are in effect now to address homelessness that you think are working or could be slightly modified uh, and be beneficial? And if, and if, what else do you think needs to be done to address this problem? And I think Mr. Bone Wave is up. Do you want it? You want us to alternate? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well. I mean, any of you that have lived your lives in Los Angeles County know that it used to be where homelessness was really just confined to downtown and Skid Row. And we were never happy about that. But what we're finding now is beyond an embarrassment for everything and everyone. And we have people literally sleeping on our overpasses, under bridges, along the riverbeds. And it's 
not right. Here's the thing. Homelessness can be solved, but as an engineer, you always take a big problem. You can't just, there's no one solution to homelessness. You have to take this massive problem and break it into smaller pieces that could be solved. Here's what's working. The Orange County Rescue Mission, which is just south of the border from us, they are privately funded. It costs roughly $14,000 per person to house and feed people that live there. These are people that can be retrained. They're there for a year and a half to two years, privately funded, no government funds, and they have a 98% success rate of getting people back on their feet. That works. What else could work? You hear many people say, well, it's Ronald Reagan's fault. How many people here can tell me how many years ago that was? And if it was his fault, then that means something that was happening before then was working, and those were conservatorships. People in elected office have to now have the backbone to be able to say that we need to put mentally ill people in hospitals with real doctors. We can't medicate them on the streets. They're a danger to themselves and to us. And when you talk about homelessness, those are real people, but the people that pay their taxes and the people that are trying to run businesses and bring their kids to the park, those are real people too. And we need to consider them and think about them and we need to take tough action. I can tell you what does work. And you alluded to one, in LA there's one called the Dream Center, in downtown LA, run by Pastor Matthew Barnett. They're about 12,500 for a family of four for an entire year. They take entire families. And they have an intensive one-year um, um, immersion a program where they get people literally off drugs, stabilized, and functioning. And then they have an extension for a second year where they aim to have everyone graduating from the second year walking away with a rented place with $10,000 in savings. And they work up toward these things. Phenomenal. Another entity, uh, West Coast Care, and this Pastor Ron Hooks, this charity actually reunites homeless people with their loved ones in other states and sends them back home where they have their family, their friends, their support network, where they're going to have the best chance of success because too many people come to the magnet of homeless in L.A. to get a quick high, get free benefits, and not do anything but lay out and, uh, you know, waiting for the mailman, as they say. And that is an excellent uh, charity. We need to see more of that. But there's four things that will work to fix the problem of homelessness. And one is we have to create the mental health treatment capacity. We do not have it. We need to quadruple or more and with a sense of urgency that doesn't exist today. We have to build substance abuse capacity. Repealing Prop 47 will go a long way towards the substance abuse one. We have to build emergency shelters like there's no tomorrow. And that's just to be in all five supervisory districts. And the fourth, easiest one, we have to regulate public space. That means you take one of the first three choices, and the fourth choice is you got to leave L.A. County. You're not going to come here to trash our county because you're a drug addict. I'm sorry. Those days are over. This is great timing because I was just handed a question which concerns Proposition 1, which I think relates to what the sheriff was just talking about. And the question is uh, Proposition 1, which will appear on the March 5th ballot, I would amend the Mental Health Services Act approved by voters in 2004 by shifting the portion of funds approved for mental health services to housing and personalized support services, et cetera, et cetera, and authorize a $6.4 billion bond to build mental health facilities and to build housing for persons experiencing homelessness and mental health challenges. Do you support Proposition 1 and if so, why? If not, why? Well, I can tell you this. Proposition 1 is a sick joke. This comes from a governor who's a $68 billion deficit after, what, $100 billion surplus? This whipsaw in the state budget illustrates how bad state government is being run. County government is no different. From 2011 to 2021, we spent $6.5 billion, roughly the same amount, 
on homeless initiatives in the county. And we saw the population of homeless double in size, actually more than double in size. So there's no correlation between throw more money at a problem and seeing it somehow diminish. It actually expands. And we need to recognize that. I will tell you this, that proposition one, if you look at the, the fine language of it, it's a boondoggle that's going to throw a lot of money at developers. And anything has to do with housing first initiative, which the state has adopted, the county has adopted, is a failed strategy. There's no such thing as a permanent housing solution for homeless, because all you're doing is two bad things at once. One, you're enabling dependency, and you're normalizing deviancy. That is not going to solve the homeless. We have to have a sense of urgency. We have to create that agency in the individual that you're responsible for improving your lot in life. You're responsible for getting a job. And those who can't because of either medical or mental issues, well, that's why we have to build up the infrastructure. But able-bodied adults, they're just coming here to flock to get all the freebies that LA offers, I'm sorry. There's no solution to that. And Prop 1 is only going to continue to fuel that. It's reckless. It's irresponsible. And trust me, the people who are going to benefit will not be the homeless. Well, I'm going to agree. Prop 1 is a disaster. And bonds are terrible for the taxpayer. And of course, it'll be great for the developers. But for us, once again, as taxpayers, we're going to be taking it in the shorts. Um, and we're shifting money away to the wrong places again. This housing first policy that California has adopted does not work. The problem with housing first is you're basically giving people that have different addictions, such as drug and alcohol addictions, a free place to live with no accountability in regards to them getting treatment. If you're a renter, which maybe many of you are renters, and you go into a place and you put a security deposit down and you trash that place, trust me, they're going to be kicking you out of there very quickly and you're going to be paying whatever the extra damages are. But for some reason, we allow homeless people to be able to trash these things with no accountability. I think about all the people that are on the low income scale of things and how they're trying to play by the rules and how unfair everything is around them. Like, I said that homelessness is one of our important issues, but it's not necessarily because I care more about homeless people than I do about anyone else. I care about homelessness because it affects all of us. And people that are trying to play by the rules they eventually just give up playing by the rules. And that's not what we want here. We want us all to be playing by the rules so that we treat each other fairly and, and, and right and equally. When our opponent that's not here tonight first took office, she said that her key issue was going to be to stop homelessness. Back then, there were about 15,000 people living on our streets. Now there's probably more than 80,000 people living on our streets. If you're going to keep voting for this person as your supervisor, you're going to see the numbers keep going up and up. She does not solve problems. She's not here tonight. Why is she not here tonight? We're both here tonight answering these questions in front of a bunch of very intelligent people that are eagerly listening and being polite. Prop one's a joke, and our current supervisor needs to go. In a related matter, we'd ask, uh, do you agree with the state of California's approach in addressing housing affordability through the passage of bills that shift land use decisions and zoning decisions from the local level to the state? Probably many of you know where I stand on this. Um, I'm 100% for local control. Sacramento is not able to solve housing problems. When I first got elected to office here in Rancho Palos Verdes, I was up in Sacramento, and I had an opportunity to meet a senator His name's Senator Weiner. <laughs> I didn't know Senator Weiner at that time, but many of the other fellow council members who have been on their city councils for many more years than I had asked him, why are you passing these bills? You're not talking to us anymore. This is going to be onerous. Why do we have to be allowed to build high-rise buildings within a quarter mile or half mile of bus stations and train stations? We don't want that. And he looked us in the eye and said, you had your chance and you failed. I don't trust you. And that was my first look at how Sacramento treats local governments now. I love local governments because we don't have R's and D's after our name. Partisanship is destroying America. 
Yes, both him and I are part of parties. We're registered with parties. But R's and D's are killing us. We need to remove them from state and federal offices as well. We need to solve problems with good people, not with partisanship. So in terms of local control and housing, it should be every city that should be allowed to do that. And our supervisors should be fighting for all 88 cities to have that freedom and independence. People that work hard live in good places. And I don't think they should ever have to apologize for that and quit calling them NIMBYs. Well, I, I agree entirely. I think local control knows a lot better than state control, which knows a lot better than federal control. As you can see, the closer you are to where actually the problem exists, you have greater knowledge. You have greater knowledge of the impact. So the ones they did, like uh, I think was it SB9, for example, the one where you're splitting lots and creating greater density, some places may work, some places may not work, but when you do these one size fit all you know, state level policies, you have really horrendous impact at the local level because they don't take into account local conditions. And there's a lot of examples of that on, in state law. So I'm gonna support local control definitely. I mean, we have to be smart. Obviously we need to build more, but when they say let's create affordable housing, I'm sorry, it's still the for-profit development that dictates what is built or what is not built based on market forces. And you're trying to create a housing that costs 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, just the regulatory environment alone to get through to approve a project, which John knows very well about, it might double the price of what you're trying to do. And you haven't even hammered one nail yet in the project. Prime, prime example is John, John um, Andy Bills, the, the head of the, the Union Rescue Mission who retired recently, he had a structure that he put in place to house 134 people on his property, a nonprofit. He says the structure cost him $700,000. When the city was done with him, it dragged it two years to go through the approval process and they added 400,000 to the cost. And that's a nonprofit. Imagine what the profit world faces. And this is the nonsense that creates things that things don't get built. You have the Point of Hills Mall that's sitting half empty. Yeah, things like that, by God, let's use mixed use things, retail, commercial, residential. There's places for that, build them up, just set them where they belong and let the local community dictate how that happens. We've got some really cool questions that are coming in right now. Uh -oh. I mean, just really cool stuff. And we're going to shift gears a little bit. This one is, what's your position on increasing the number of L.A. County supervisors to better represent the residents of the county? Well, it's funny. I had a sit-down interview with the L.A. Times editorial board, the same one that endorsed Gascon, by the way. So you know where, you know where this interview went. And I told them, the Board of Supervisors is only five people, and they're both the executive and the legislative branch of county government. Not only is the county of LA bigger than 40 states, the county budget is bigger than the state budget of 42 states. But only four, five people control it, and there is zero oversight. We need to have an elected county mayor who is the official executive branch of county government. And the Board of Supervisors should be a strictly a legislative body only. Could we double the size and have the county mayor be the tiebreaker for a split? Yeah, that would work. But let's cut their salary in half so it doesn't cost you a penny more. And now, now we're talking because now we have a legislative branch and we have more eyes on a problem. You're going to have better outcomes than we have five people who are accountable to nobody. And you look at the current incumbent. She hired her son as her chief of staff. Her daughter-in-law is her field deputy. So when they're starting to close down businesses left and right in the pandemic, they didn't feel the sting like all those businesses that suffered enormously or they were deemed non-essential, yet people relied on their jobs to put food on their tables. I never bought into that argument. So there's definitely, we need separation of powers between the executive and legislative branch. And I hate to create more elected positions, but if we make them cheaper, 
more of them, but we have a separate county mayor, I think we might achieve some of that governance that we don't have today. And we don't have this runaway a government, county government. Remember, their budget when the incumbent started was 29.9 billion. Now it's 46.7 billion. That's a huge increase in eight years. Let's stop that. I'm gonna differ a little bit on that answer. I know him and I probably have a lot of similarities on the first few answers, but on this one, I wanna remind people about another body of government officials that have 15 members, and that's called the City of Los Angeles Council. If you think more people that don't know what they're doing is better, <laughs> you're wrong. And I know it doesn't seem like they're held accountable, but they can be held accountable, and they can be held accountable by us, the voters. That's how it's supposed to work. I love the fact that there's a packed house here tonight, and I hope that lots of people are watching this because we had someone that's an incumbent that decided to not show up because she believes she'll be stuffing buses full of union members and driving their ballots to the ballot box for the next month. If that's how we want our elections to be solved and determined, then we're all in a lot of trouble. We need to bring all of us back to be voting and listening to people and holding us accountable as elected officials. The LA County government worked when it had five people that were qualified to be supervisors. But unfortunately, what you have now you don't have five people that are qualified. And I agree, one thing I do agree is the budget is ridiculous. Our tax dollars are just being abused left and right. We need our money that we work for more than they need our money now. And as a supervisor, I'm gonna find ways so that you can keep more of your money. So I don't believe that we need five or 10 or 20 more bad supervisors. I think we need five great supervisors. That way we can hold them accountable as voters and we can make a difference this year in 2024. I didn't even think of this until somebody wrote this on this card. Do you have any proposals for giving our youth economic opportunities in the county, getting them a head start or getting them on a career path. This is kind of like a softball with our current incumbent. I'm sorry, we cannot keep raising the minimum wage. Every time you raise the minimum wage, you're taking away those economic opportunities from our youth and you're killing jobs and you're killing businesses. And a lot of people don't realize this, but anyone that has professional businesses where they bring in interns or others, when you have a $15 minimum wage in an hourly job, that's a $30 an hour minimum for a salary job. And so jobs are not just being killed in the fast food industry, but they're being destroyed in all of our businesses. That's why businesses are trying to automate at a record pace right now, because they can't afford to have people. They want people. I'm a business owner. I cannot hire the people I want if I don't pay them what they deserve and what they're, what they're willing to work for. I can't pay them a penny less because if I try to, they're going to my competition. And that's why minimum wage is wrong. Government should get off of our back. So the best thing we could do to our youth is to get government off our back and quit doing things like minimum wage because that's destroying jobs for our youth. Well, let me add to that. We used to have vocational training. We used to have very extensive vocational training, shop, and pick up. Everybody in this room, I bet you can recall when you went through high school, there was all kinds of different shop. And, and a lot of those went straight into the trades and straight into jobs. Not everyone is going to go to college. It turns out, especially if you're going to Harvard, it's not quite all it used to be, right? <laughs> But where the, where the jobs are needed are in skilled vocational positions where we don't have them. 
We need electricians. We need welders. We need all kinds of people, masonry, all these things, especially if we're in the, in the building environment. We need them, and we run short. In fact, a lot of the construction downtown LA got slowed down because of lack of workers. Imagine that. And we need those people. We need those apprenticeship, you know, the electric uh, union, electric union, all these people, they're trying to push to get people to get into those career paths, and they pay good jobs, living wages. But John is right in this regard. Throwing more and more um, minimum wage and rising, raising the minimum wage, look what Pizza Hut did when in response to that law that just came out. First thing that day, they announced layoffs because then that could, they could not pencil it out to make a profit. The businesses still exist to make a profit. That's how they stay alive and they stay competitive. And if they're going to throw these, well, then they're just going to figure out, well, where do we cut our costs? In the workforce. It's not going to work. Those minimum wage jobs exist, and that's what college kids use to work their way through college, for example, but they're not designed to be career jobs. They never should be. They should be temporary jobs as people are transitioning through life and going on to bigger and better things. But trying to make a career out of being in a, in a minimum wage job so that when we have to raise the minimum wage, well, you know, you're just ch chasing your tail, running around in circles. That is not a, a, a good economic output for anybody, much less the business or the employees. Ultimately, the ones end, end up getting laid off because of minimum wage. I think the twin person who of the or the twin of the person who wrote that last question submitted this one, but it's related. And that is what would you do as supervisor to address overreaching land use and business suffocating environmental restrictions in order to bring industry back to LA County? Good question. Some some environmental regulations work. If you look at the ones that cleaned up our air, for example, long term. If you remember back in the 70s and 80s, uh, stage two smog alerts, have you ever heard, heard of one recently? Yeah. That worked. That part worked. It saved a lot. In fact, the cost saves in terms of just the mental or the medical impact on asthma, respiratory disease, and all these things that because of those rules were alleviated, that was a plus to the community. But then you look at CEQA, the Environmental uh, Quality Act. Every single development, we're going to throw a CEQA lawsuit on and we're going to block it. Okay, but what does CEQA have to do for a residential development in a community that's already been built out? Nothing at all, because you're not impacting. But then what does the Board of Supervisors do? They approve Tejon Ranch, a brand new city in the middle of nowhere with no infrastructure, no water, in a sensitive environmental area. So why did it get a 5 Zero, unanimous vote of approval, because the supervisor were receiving campaign contributions from all the developers. A lot of palms were greased, and all of a sudden, a horrendous, environmentally unsustainable development was allowed to exist that would add in more cars to the freeways, worsen the air and everything, instead of doing the infill along transit corridors, which would make sense. So there needs to be sustainable development for sure, but those are examples of what we can do, what we shouldn't be doing. Well, uh, so the Board of Supervisors, one of the things they did a few years ago was they said that we're going to stop banning or drilling for oil, and of course they banned fracking. And we would all love to have done that, but unfortunately what it's created is hyperinflation because we all require our cars to run on fossil fuels, whether we like it or not. And that's the engine that's made our country great. We should be exploring not just wind and solar, but we should be looking at things like geothermal. There's a huge geothermal uh, reservoir right below our, our land here in the, the San Pedro Bay. Also, CEQA is another thing that I've been fighting against for years. I used to be the president of the Harbor Association of Industry and Commerce that would represent the businesses in and around both ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. And we would go to Sacramento every year. We'd have to re-educate the new legislators on what CEQA is. And, but CEQA is not being used for what it was intended for. Now it's just being used as a way for uh, stopping projects that are the enemies of enemies. It's horrible. Like We shouldn't have to go through these CEQA processes as long as we're following the right codes and building codes and ordinances. Developers aren't out there to destroy the world. They, they know that if they start to pollute, they're going to get 
heavily fined. So you really don't need CEQA on many of these projects, and we should eliminate that. And it's funny how CEQA gets eliminated when it's one of the big projects from either the governor or another elected official. So clearly it's not being used in a fair way. Another thing we have is we have the AQMD. The AQMD is an unelected body that does things like point source rules. Right now they're trying to look for ways to tax trucks and trains and ships, and that's going to destroy our ports. So I'm all for environmental regulations, but I'm not for destroying our businesses that we rely on every day. Here's something a little bit different that somebody submitted, and that is, A, do you, do you agree that there's a problem with gun violence, and is it, do you think that there's anything that we, can be done at the county level to address the problem? Um, I think there's a crime problem. I know that our supervisors like to blame the guns, but it's the criminals that are acting in that capacity, and they need to be locked up. So do I think there's a, a gun violence problem? Yeah, there's a gun violence problem because our criminals are on the street using guns against each other. And so we should be locking them up. So that's why there's a gun problem and a gun violence problem, and that's what our supervisors should be doing. We should be supporting district attorneys that aren't light on crime like the current district attorney. You saw our opponent that's not here tonight support him in the past. We're waiting for her to support him this time. She's probably politically smart enough to not do it this time around. But for me, I'm for anyone but Gascon. Thank you. We had a grim reminder of real violence, and that was out in the desert just uh, today. Six bodies appeared full of bullet holes and burned, and the cartel is here. And they're all about violence, OK? And now keep that in mind. And what did the board have a motion uh, yeah, yesterday, Tuesday, about deputies and possessing firearms if they're going to go drinking? The sheriff's department already has policies that address that, but they were had a solution in search of a problem. Now the question is, what about holding criminals accountable when they use a firearm? They refuse to, but the state and the county are trying desperately to find ways to limit concerted carry permits, CCWs. As sheriff, I made it available to everyone who qualified for them. So we went from 200 to 4,600 CCWs. And it worked. And what is the violence rate of people that with CCW permit holders? Zero. What is the rate of violence of uh, parolees that have been convicted and sentenced for using firearms when they get out? Oh, about 70% plus. And what is our district attorney doing about them? No. They're, see, the criminals are the new victims. And the law enforcement is the oppressor. So we need to release this burden over them because they're really victims and we need to make them feel more comfortable. No, we need to actually start enforcing the rule of law when it comes to, if you commit a crime with a gun, you should pay a really, really heavy price so you can't do that crime again. If that means you have to cool your heels in prison or in jail, so be it. But other people are going to benefit from that. And that is where we need to go towards law and order. And see, this whole nonsense about gun violence is trying to remove the perpetrator from it to blame the inanimate object. No, it's the people using guns that are the problem. This one has nothing to do with guns or gun violence, but it does have to do with public transportation. And that is, do you see that there's any change in the need for public transportation in the foreseeable future from what we've been doing in the past? And if so, how would you address that change? What sort of public transportation do you foresee uh, LA County having over the next decade? Well, we need a better public transit system. We need a transit system where you're not going to be set on fire. You're not going to be stabbed. You're not going to be raped. You're not going to be exposed to god-awful, horrific things, which the Board of Supervisors wants you to experience as a passenger on the MTA system. They have literally voted to decriminalize all the bad things you don't want to see in a train. 
They voted to decriminalize them. They voted to, to handcuff law enforcement so they couldn't enforce quality of life crimes on the trains. They couldn't enforce fair evasion. And then came the ambassadors with the green shirts. And then they said, well, we need less cops and we need more ambassadors so the passengers could feel safe. And they are so full of it because I spoke to the passengers myself on the trains and they said, we don't want to see twice as many of you. That's what they said. They did their own survey, the MTA, and 77 or 80 percent of the passengers wanted to see more cops on the train. So what was the answer for the MTA? Let's get rid of the cops on the train. They are not listening to you. They don't care what you have to say because for them, it's a big social experiment based on ideology, this progressive, far, far, ultra far left ideology, but they don't ride the trains and the buses. It's the poor people that are working that need to use those trains and buses, and they're the ones that have to face the unruly passengers. You know they have over 700 people living on the trains? Have you seen toilets on the trains? Do the math. And that is what they're forcing the passengers to experience. Why? Because they're so out of touch, this elitist, pearl-clutching crowd that really does not care about the people that actually have to use a train. It's not a homeless encampment. It's supposed to be a transit system, get people from point A to point B. And as a member of the Board of Supervisors, I become a member of the MTA, and Lord willing, I will make sure that it becomes a transit system again. So as a civil engineer, um, I've been in the transportation industry for my entire professional career, and I'm still a real believer in the freedom of the automobile. I think that, once again, government tries to force us onto things that we don't necessarily want to use, and you are going from nowhere to nowhere. And if you're going to keep them unsafe and unclean, then people aren't going to use them. And time and time again, it's shown that as people have enough money to afford a car, they stop riding the trains and the buses, and they get their own car. So I think we should allow the people to speak and tell us what they want. And I think freedom in your car is what they want. Unfortunately, the trains aren't working. So I actually think that there are some certain bus lines that work great. I think we should continue those. But if you're going to have any type of bus line or train line, you better make sure they're safe and you better make sure they're clean before you do anything else. Ambassadors, are great at giving directions or telling you how much to pay for your fare, but they're not anywhere near uh, what you want for your security. We need the sheriffs and the police departments on those trains. I think that there are some opportunities to, when we do build any of these public infrastructure projects, what happens now is the government forces us to use project labor agreements, union labor, I'm all for union labor, but I'm also all for non-union labor. I believe in competition. I believe our tax dollar goes much farther when you have unions competing against non-union companies and not just using one form of those labor. And so for me, I want to open up competition. I want to make sure that our tax dollars get used wisely so we get many more projects going. Because right now, it seems like all we worry about is the next Olympics. Well, what about what we need right now? We need to take care of taxpayers and the residents immediately. I'm going to shift gears once again. We're going to try to cover a lot of different topics here tonight if we can. What's your plan to address Southern California's chronic water shortage? Do you think there's anything that can be done at the county level? And if so, what's your proposal? Uh, yes. Well, first of all, the state starts, needs to start using our tax dollars for building water reservoirs and other things that we've already paid for for decades. Um, that's the first thing. And so our county needs to be stepping up and telling, our, telling Sacramento politicians to do that. But there's also engineering solutions that could be done. I know that the residents of LA County have been asked to conserve water, and you guys have all done an excellent job of that. I know many communities have basically clear-cut your property so you don't have lawns, and you, you're not enjoying your property the way you'd want to, but you've sacrificed to do that. But there are engineering solutions to that. There's enough water that we, in terms of 
every day people are watering their lawns, there's runoff, and we have catch basins, and those catch basins basically take all the water to the ocean. If we were to actually take that water and send it back to our treatment plants, we would be able to reuse so much water in LA County that we wouldn't have issues anymore. And I know that there's some great engineers that work for the Los Angeles County Sanitation Department, and we want to leverage that engineering knowledge to be able to use that sort of technology to conserve water. I think we have done our part in terms of conservation, but now it's time for engineering solutions. Well, I can tell you this. Every time there's a big rainfall like we just had a few days ago, just drive over the LA River and you can, your answer's right there. About 95% of the water that falls down goes right out into the ocean. Along the way, it does, it performs like a toilet and picks up all the human feces and all the waste in all the homeless encampments that are in all these river beds and all the places where they shouldn't be, and they deposit it in the bay where you want the tourists to come swim. So you can see there's a lot of problems. They're all kind of working together against each other, and we need to, we need to have some common sense in this, Lord Jesus. And <laughs> it's... The solutions are, there are engineering solutions. We should be pumping water back into the aquifers. Instead of having it drying up, we keep drawing down wells and we're not pumping it back and we keep losing water to the ocean. We need to do that desperately. Are there solutions? I know they're trying to build a aqueduct to send more water from north down south. If they got extra water, we'll take it. But again, that has its implications for the water table in the, in the valley, in the San Joaquin Valley. So there's, there are solutions out there. Unfortunately, the short-sighted people that are in charge right now are not thinking big. No, they're playing small ball. When we have, we need big solutions for big problems, and the sh we are going to be chronically in a water shortage because, hello, we're in a desert. It, just because we have uh, golf courses all green and green thing everywhere, we're still in a desert, which means on average we're going to have very little waterfall to replenish this. So if we have a, a, a small snow pack like we're having this year, as opposed to last year, we're going to be back in this water crisis, in and out of the water crisis. So we got to start thinking big and think long term. Now we've touched upon public transit and we've touched upon water. And somebody asked the overarching question, which makes perfect sense at this point, and that is, what do you see as the most significant infrastructure problem in the 4th District, and what's your proposal to deal with it? I see the biggest infrastructure problem in the 4th is going to be at transportation. And there's other ones that are, you know, obviously the water is one, but the transportation infrastructure is there. We built out single family home residential that has big urban sprawl, and we don't have the public transit system to accommodate it. And now that everybody's pushing towards electric vehicles and all that, we still have the issue of is it feasible or that many people are going to jump on that? A lot of people don't really like electric vehicles and are kind of taking a step back from that. So there's a lot of problems there, but if I were to think big, I'd say our transit issue, getting people from home to work and back home, where work is located, for example, and we keep pushing, I mean, thankfully we've kind of stopped this continuous sprawl now, so we don't have people commuting as much as we did before. The pandemic cured some of it with a lot of at-home work. It took a somewhat alleviated the problem, but now that pushes back on, where people are jumping back on the freeways. If you remember during the pandemic where you could drive from here to downtown in like in record time, and not anymore. Heck, even on the weekend now, you jump, you're looking at a freeway on a weekend, you go, this has got to be an easy drive, and there you are bumper to bumper, mm -hmm. upset at the world, because that, that transportation infrastructure does not match the needs of the county. I think that's the biggest challenge we're facing. And I'm going to build on that because I agree with what he just said. Um, so this week, our current supervisor, she did another big important thing for our county. She went ahead and renamed the train. <laughs> well, last summer, she repainted lifeguard stations multicolors. These are the things that our board of supervisors does. They, they, they do not solve our problems. Our biggest problem right now is transportation, and we're not going to be back in a pandemic, and we need to be in our cars driving around getting our families to places and get to work. 
And what's happened is we have these measures, Measure R, Measure S, the sales tax that's destroying businesses in LA County. And we were all expecting at least three quarters of a billion dollars to go to the 710 corridor. But because of environmental pressures, the Metro, which the supervisors are on that board, decided, you know what, no project. So I guess we as taxpayers should ask, are we gonna get our three quarters of a billion dollars back for no project? Because what that's done is you have a beautiful Gerald Desmond Bridge. I love that bridge. The first day it opened, I got in my car, drove it one way, came back. Just to do it, just to say to an audience like this that I did it. But once you get off that 710 freeway and hit, or the, the, that bridge and you hit that 710 freeway, what do you got? You got a nightmare of trucks. And now, and that's the biggest thing that affects the fourth district in LA County because that 710 corridor is basically goes right through the fourth district. So it affects all of them in that district. And so, and it's also now affecting the South Bay because now the trucks are coming to the 110 freeway because the truckers are going crazy because they're stuck in that traffic too. It's a nightmare for them. They're losing money sitting in those trucks longer. So here's what I propose to do. And I know maybe people are not huge Elon Musk fans, but he's come up with some amazing ideas. And one of those ideas is he's learned how to tunnel quickly and the hyperloop. I propose that we do a hyperport. We take our containers, we drop them in the ground, we shoot them out to the Inland Empire and get rid of all the truck traffic once and for all. Wow. <laughs> you know, um, I just like to hear the sheriff comment about that if you have any thoughts about <laughs> a hyperloop for th to alleviate the traffic on the 710 freeway, because I've sat on the 710 for many a minute in traffic jams. Well, I, can, I can tell you this. Uh, I've sat on the 710. And I went to an event in San Pedro, and I followed the, the, the map on my car, and going down Alameda and get to San Pedro to where the uh, Longshoremen, I think, union is, and it was an off-road experience. Huh. <laughs> I almost lost the bottom carriage of my car, and I could not believe the state of the, of the roads right around there, right where they're dumping off the, the things, the, the cargo containers are on the, the semis, and they're rolling up north, and... Holy moly, did they like forget this part of the world exists? I could not believe it. Potholes that could swallow this table. <laughs> That's what's there. So we got so much work ahead of us. And one of it is we have to start doing the obvious. And the county doesn't like to do the obvious. And Mayor, I'd, I'd like to allow you a couple more minutes to expand on your proposal because it's an interesting <laughs> one. Well, uh, so... Look, I mean, anyone that's lived in L.A. County, you know that traffic continues to get worse and we continue to pour money at things. And we know that building wider freeways, double-deckers, the environmentalists are not going to allow us to do that. They're just not. That's why the 710 corridor project died, because people, even though they don't necessarily th believe that the trucks are going to move faster and they're not going to be sitting there with more exhaust, Basically, that project was killed. So that's not coming back in terms of widening or unless you have a new board of supervisors, which we should have. So basically, the idea would be truck traffic is what makes things so miserable during the day. And trust me, the truckers hate, they hate that anyhow. It would be much better for them. They have a huge need for truckers all over. And so I'm not worried about them getting those. That's a resilient group of people. But getting those containers out of those ports without having to hit the 110 and the 710 freeway would be a dream for all of us. And I believe that that's really the only alternative that people would allow that would get those trucks off and it would keep those containers underground and out to the Inland Empire. And it would also accelerate the way in which our containers get out because I think they say something like 80% of the uh, goods and services come from our ports through our ports. Our ports are so important, and it's up to our supervisors to make sure that those ports thrive and, and continue to have great jobs for people and continue to bring the goods and services. So 
we should be exploring ideas like that. And currently, we're not. We're just stuck in the mud with, with doing nothing. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I see we're drawing close to our time uh, to, the, to the end of this um, session. But I would like to loop back to the uh, topic of homelessness again, if we can, and ask each of you whether you have any data regarding the percentage of homeless who, homeless who suffer from mental health uh, problems <clears throat> and the source of those studies. And then what programs you think would be most beneficial to help the problem? Thank you. I don't know the exact percentage, and I don't know if anyone really does. I've heard anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, and that's a tremendous amount of people, especially when there's probably more than 80,000 people on our streets. So I mean, even if it's just one person, I mean, that's we want to help the one person. So it doesn't matter the numbers. The numbers are, there's a lot. And I think it was alluded to earlier that we just don't have the beds to be able to take care of it. The state law hurts us because you can only have so many beds per facility. And so there's so many things that we've done to handicap ourselves when it comes to solving problems. And it always feels like people are always just pointing fingers that it's their job, it's someone else's job. Well, it's time for our Board of Supervisors being the largest board of supervisors in the country to step up to the plate and to start solving our problems. This is the reason I'm running. I can't take it anymore. I can't take the fact that we've got five supervisors that all they worry about is Instagram posts and how they look and getting reelected and having big uh, hand sanitizers. You can get at a, a fair that's multicolored with their name on it. I mean, that seems like that's all they're good at. We need people to, we need to start holding them accountable. You need to elect new people that are gonna solve these problems. So with mental illness, like I mentioned, we've gotta bring conservatorships back for the mentally ill because people that are of that state, they are not of right mind to be able to make a proper decision for themselves. We need to treat them until they can make a proper decision. We wanna help them but it's not helping them by giving them drugs and sending them back out to the streets to get hurt and to hurt other people. That doesn't work for anyone. And so for me, conservatorships, I, I believe, are one of the prime ways to solve the mental illness, homelessness problem. Well, I'll give you some hard numbers from my experience. In the county jail, 42% of the population suffers from some form of mental illness. And that number keeps climbing every year. A good chunk of those, when they're released, become the homeless on the streets. From our data from the Homeless Outreach Service Team, about 70% of the homeless population suffers from either mental illness, substance abuse, or a combination of the two. The lethal combo, 70%. The LA Times likes to insist it's a housing first, and if they had housing, they'd be in housing. It is not is mental health and substance abuse. When the Board of Supervisors, including Janice Hahn, canceled the Mental Health Treatment Center project, which would have torn down Men's Central Jail, reduced our county jail population beds by 1,000, and provided the appropriate therapeutical environment to treat inmates with mental, abuse, mental health issues, they decided to not do it at all. They paid an $80 million penalty. It didn't get built. We're still with a problem today, which means it's gonna to have to be built at twice the cost of 2019. And imagine all that wasted effort. In the Lantern and Petra Short Act, I think 1967, is one of the first things that the state has done that they always punt. We don't like something, so we're just gonna outlaw it and we'll have somebody else do something else. Mental health institutions were shut down. It'll be community solutions. They were never built. There's your homeless population. Group homes for children, we don't want those anymore. So the state bans them. Oh, it'll be the county's responsibility. Now you have kids in hotels, and you have social workers babysitting kids in hotels because there's nowhere to put them. Same thing's happening with the jails. AB 109, prison realignment. Oh, we don't want prisons, so let's kick it down to the county jails. Now the county jails, they don't have the staffing for them now with the staffing crisis. We're going to release them out on the street, catch and release. You see how this perpetual, let's get rid of something, but they never have a solution that works. We need to stop that. Now, 
This may be the toughest question that I've seen posed so far, but it only is going to take about 15 seconds for each of you to answer uh -oh. it. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Ooh. Ouch. It's here. I always root for underdogs. <laughs> Me too. So I'm, I'm kind of inclined to the Detroit Lions because I don't think they've ever won anything. <laughs> but the four good teams that are left for a reason, all four are good in different ways, but I don't like to see repeat Super Bowl people. Mayor. I'm a Rams fan, so I cannot see the 49ers winning, and I'm not going to say the 49ers. I would love to see Detroit win because I think that they're an amazing story this year, but I, I unfortunately, I think the Ravens are just too good. They're, they're just too good. Nobody's stopping them. There was a very local uh, uh, topic um, brought to my attention. The Portuguese Bend landslide is the largest in the Western Hemisphere. What steps do you see the county taking to address the dangers posed by that in our area? I can go first. That's a little bit unfair question for him uh, because we talk about the landslide all the time in our city, but uh, I'm sure he'll have a great answer as well. And so everyone knows that the county un unfortunately created the landslide, not, not by purpose, but they were, they were uh, basically grading for to extend Crenshaw back in the 1950s, and they activated the ancient landslide. And, and so kind of the rest is history. Um, the county did step up at one point and did pay lawsuits to residents, and, and our city does allow people to live in the Portuguese Bend area, but not really the same permit process that the rest of the city has. And if you've been there, and I know many of you have been or have seen it on the news, many of the homes are on crates and, and containers, and, and, it's, and there's some places where homes were level and now they're 80 foot different, and it's just been moving forever. And, and so unfortunately this year, though, uh, because of the rain we had last year, the water table was used to be 90 90 feet deep, now it's roughly eight or nine feet deep. So the water has come way up and saturated that land mass that's sliding and it's actually expanded beyond just the typical area of the Portuguese Bend and it's gone into both the, the Sea View and the Condite uh, Canyon. Uh, Abalone Cove landslide area as well. And so those areas are now moving and we've had two homes red tagged, which is very, very unfortunate. And I have some of my friends in the audience that live right across the street from that particular uh, location. And I know that they're very concerned. Um, the county has actually been good partners with us. Um, our city went out and we got a, a, a lot of money from the federal government, which we were very appreciative of. Um, and, and we're, of course, you know, hoping that the county will step up and give us some more some money to actually match those funds. So that's what I would hope that the county would do. If I'm on the board of supervisors, I'll make sure that the county is funding uh, Rancho Palos Verdes for their project because really it's going to require a, a very massive drainage uh, project for us to start to get the water out of there and to minimize the amount of land movement. It's a very complicated problem. Well, I'm not going to follow up an engineer. I think that was a pretty good description. <laughs> but I will tell you the role that government should play. One is whenever you're building in a place that is ge ge geologically unstable or of material that's uh, porous or absorbs and holds a lot of water content, you're going to create problems because now you're introducing man into what was a natural environment. Same thing like, you know, building cabins in the forest. You saw what happened a lot of places when you have forest fires and... The entire place has gone paradise. Uh, COVID, a prime example up north in that tragedy. And what is a proper role of government? Well, let's build in places that are buildable, that uh, we can be pretty confident that nothing is going anywhere and our house is not going to creep away from us. Because when you build, you're diverting the natural water. It's going to go somewhere. But now because you have uh, non-porous, the sidewalks, the streets, all these places. Now you're diverting water in places that, you know, natural history of the area, it wasn't designed to be. Because that place exists over, you know, eons, and it all collected at one point. But once you built into it, now you changed the character of it. And now we're seeing the impact. What is the proper role of government is not to set foot in that place in the first place knowing this ahead of time. So like you said, diverting uh, for uh, the in 1950s on, on Culver City, well, 
we're kind of creating the problem that then we're going to have a crisis 20, 30, year, 40 years later. Let's avoid that. But because the county played a role in it, it's proper that the county make sure that the residents, uh, their land is stabilized to the best they can because the county has resources. The individual homeowner won't. And the private insurance, you know, they're not going to, you know, they'll just say, hey, we're, we're dumping you and we're off. So the government does play a role and it should be that. But at the same time, thinking ahead, Let's not build, for example, a house is in a floodplain. Yeah, it's going to get flooded. Things like that. You just talked about housing, and I see a question here that says, does the county have a census of the number of unoccupied residences? Because we seem to be having a housing shortage or an affordable housing shortage but it may well be that it's not being used, the stock that we have isn't being used optimally. Oh, uh, there, we do know that there are roughly 1,200 unoccupied lands and buildings in LA County and city, 1,200. And that is a count, I think, from a year ago that are just not being used, they sit empty. We're not even going into private property in terms of dwelling, like apartment buildings and all that. There are several luxury apartment complexes in LA that have been sitting empty for several years now, that they're waiting for the right market conditions to then lease it out, but they don't want to lease it out at the prevailing market right now. So they're just holding on and they just sit empty while people sleep in tents outside in front. It's kind of weird. And is there a proper role? Eminent domain, you're going to scare a lot of people with that concept, but there are places that, yeah, we could probably put people. Remember I talked about the 70%? Well, the 30% are people that through either no fault of their own, they got laid off at work, they're fleeing domestic violence or some any combination of those type of things. They are the easiest people to place and they're gonna move on with their life if they're given that opportunity. And I say there's a match that can be made with some properties in that type of person, not the other 70%. That is a different problem unto itself. But the 30%, we could avail ourselves a lot of the vacant properties that are out there right now. I, I don't know the answer to that, if the county actually has keeps track of how many vacant properties. Um, I guess so. They have 115,000 employees, so there's probably a few of them doing that. Well, one of the issues with... Uh, not allowing the free market to work like has happened in Los Angeles County is that you have building owners. I'm one of them. I own a small commercial building in San Pedro. And it's uh, after COVID because of the way we've changed our way in which we work. And many people work from home much more now. Uh, a lot of these commercial office buildings are vacant uh, for the most part. They're 20, 30, 40% vacant. And any of you that owns a piece of property uh, like I do know that when a building is sitting that vacant, you're losing money, and you've got a you've got a problem, and so as someone and and so if you look at and many of the people that own those sort of buildings are just mom and pops. They've actually invested their whole lives. These are uh, retirees that have investments in these properties, and now they're losing money, and they they say to themselves, "Wow, well the rents are so high. I would love to just offer rent to someone for a lower price, fill up the building, and it'd be great." But the problem is you realize that if you convert into a condition where you're renting, now you've got to deal with the county with their eviction moratoriums and their rent control and their planning department that never gets anything done. And so you realize that even though financially it would be much better, you realize that you're never going to get these potential bad tenants out. You're only going to be able to charge so much. You can't allow the free market to work. And so now the buildings just sit empty and people lose lots of money, and then eventually they just go bankrupt and leave them. And so for me, I don't know if they're counting the number of vacant buildings. What I want the county to be doing is getting off of our backs and start to allow us to use our properties in ways that the market is dictating to us. And right now, we demand housing. Let's make that happen. I told you at the beginning that we'd be wrapping this up at 8.30. So this is going to be the last question. And I don't know who gave us this question, but I really appreciate this because it's this a great last question. 
both of you address the important concerns that we care most about, and your answers or positions are often quite similar. How can we avoid splitting votes which lead to the current supervisor, the incumbent, winning? Well, I'm gonna go first here. So <laughs> vote John Crookshank for supervisor. That, that way you don't split the vote at all. He'll say the same thing. So I, I think you all realize that we start voting here very soon. And that's why the level of interest and enthusiasm has gone up quite a bit, which is great. And it shows you that we're not gonna just anoint people to positions anymore. We're gonna start paying attention and we're gonna vote for the best people for these offices. And I could tell you, and I'm just gonna give him a compliment because he's been so great to me, both of us are better than the current supervisor. Yeah. I, I can tell that he's someone that, that is a, a listener and he, he's been on the campaign trail working hard, but not just that, but he understands and I understand that the best way to represent people is to use your ears and mouth proportionally. And what's happened with our Board of Supervisors is they've stopped listening. And because they've stopped listening, to most of us, they do listen to special interest groups, but they don't listen to us. Just try calling. You got a problem? Call. In Rancho Palos Verdes, we're much different. You call, we'll fix things. I'll answer the phone. I give my phone number out. Mr. Villanueva gives his phone number out. I'm sure, I, in fact, the first time I called him, he answered. Those are the type of people that you want to elect. So of course it's going to be a hard decision between him and I. I believe that my experience in terms of being a mayor and being a business owner are hugely, and an engineer, are hugely important to the county right now. You don't have anyone like me that's going to be on that board of supervisors. And so now you're going to have the diversity of thought. That's the only diversity we should ever care about. I'll make it real simple. I will support if I'd if we get uh, the incumbent into a runoff. I will support the challenger, and I'll do the same. In fact, I'll campaign with them. And I'll tell you this. When I was sheriff, I did 104 town halls. I crisscrossed the county dozens of times, thousands of miles driven, listening to communities just like yours. In fact, I did one, I believe I did one here a while back. And the important thing is the board does not want to hear from you. No, not at all. Why they have their meetings on Tuesdays at 930? Just to listen to the activists who are not working not to the working stiffs, okay? I believe that the Board of Supervisors should be a road show. It should be in the evenings, and they should be traveling all over the county, get off their tails, get out of their ivory towers, and start listening to you. That's what I'm gonna do. I did it as sheriff. I'm gonna do it as supervisor. And that way, that is how we have a truly representative government that is listening. And we need that diversity of thought. We need that diversity of perspective and most importantly of all, diversity of action. We're gonna do things differently. As sheriff, I took a lot of initiatives from the beginning, body-worn cameras, I converted a deficit into a surplus, did all kinds of activities and actions and policies that made the department better, fully staffed. We need to do a lot of things. County government is way too large because you have a lot of cubicle hamsters that are just cranking out paperwork and that's all they do when it comes to actually providing service to the community, it keeps shrinking, but yet the budget gets bigger and bigger. We gotta stop this. We need to have a board that actually reflects the people, not just the career politicians. You know, at the beginning, I mentioned that we would give each candidate three minutes to make their closing remarks. And some of your answers actually have already given us, I think, a preview of that. But please, go ahead. Uh, we appreciate your coming. And if you have anything else that you want to add, this is the time to do it. Thank you. 
Well, first of all, I appreciate CHOA having this forum. This is the only city of the 32 cities that's doing anything like this yet. And so that says a lot about Rancho Palos Verdes and the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And that's why when I come to a city council meeting every other Tuesday, I always say how honored I am to be representing the people of Rancho Palos Verdes because you're engaged and you care. I want what Rancho Palos Verdes residents have for all 88 cities in Los Angeles County. And we can have that with the right size government, having the right experts, having the right people in county government. I don't know if 115,000 people is the right number. It's probably way over what you need. You need to have a mixture of experts and, and uh, managers and directors. When I first started running, I reached out to the CEO of the county. Her name's Fezia Davenport. I asked her if I can spend 30 minutes with her on the phone. I'm running for county supervisor. I'm currently a city council member in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. I was expecting, like, when I first ran in Rancho Palos Verdes, our city manager here invited me to his office and we spent an hour and a half talking about everything that the city does. I was just a candidate for city council then. I expected that, at least a half hour call. It took several emails. Eventually I got an email back saying she doesn't have time. That is the sort of thing that we're all dealing with with Los Angeles County now. And enough's enough. The other day I was honored to receive the endorsement of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And those of you that know, they fight for our property rights. They very rarely endorse county supervisor candidates and certainly those that aren't incumbents. It takes a lot of guts for them to do that. But the reason they did that is they know that our property rights have been under assault as we've talked about today. They know that the current representative is not representing you as the taxpayer, you as the property owner, you as the business owner. That's what I'm gonna do is represent all of you, whoever you are, wherever you live, Los Angeles County, not just the fourth district. The fourth district has 32 amazing cities. There's a city of Long Beach that has hundreds of thousands of people. There's a city of Vernon that has 222 people. They're vastly different, but the people all want the same thing. They want safety. They want less homelessness. They want to just live their lives in peace. They want the American dream. So I humbly ask you all for my vote for county supervisor. Please visit my website, johncrookshank.us. Please tell your friends and family and everyone you know about me. I have a name recognition issue, but with your help, I can win. Thank you. Well, thank you all for uh, attending, listening, and being patient as we went through a lot of these very important questions for everyone. And I'll tell you this, about 2008 was a point of departure for county government. That's when convicted felon Mark Reilly Thomas first arrived on the board as a career politician. And from that point forward, the county government's been a downward slide. It accelerated with inclusion of Sheila Kuehl, a named felony suspect on corruption. And it did not improve from there because what we had is before that, we had roughly a, a two to three spit between liberal and conservative voices. It kind of varied back and forth, but it was always that two or three split. Then it became a hard four and one or five and oh. And from that point forward, you had a very far left, ultra progressive viewpoint that dominated all of county government. Every single commission is dominated by people with a far left viewpoint. There are no conservatives, there are no moderates, there's no taxpayers, concerned parents, uh, passengers on public transit. They're not welcome. You have to be an activist of the far left to gain admission to one of these commissions. And the point is, all those voices are important. And I'm not poking fun at those that espouse a progressive viewpoint. I value their opinion, but they only deserve one seat at the table, not every single seat. That is what's destroying county government, and that's why I'm fighting hard to get balance back to the board so we can have moderate voices. I need to have Democrats speaking to Republicans without getting set on fire. It works. 
And I've been speaking to both parties and people are starting to realize, hey, you know what? What separates is, is small compared to what unites us. And we need to have a purple county where we have people from both parties, independence people, don't care about any party, but to care about solving the problems that we're facing together. And that is a homeless crisis. That is crime out of control. That is public corruption. I want to see the end of this uh, oversight as using a wet, as a weapon to cudgel sheriffs or district attorneys they don't like. We need to have a criminal justice oversight that encompasses the district attorney's office, the sheriff, probation department. And these people should be representing of all of the county and not friends of organized criminal enterprises or fundraisers for elected officials at the county level. That's not oversight, that's a joke. So there's a lot of things we can do to improve government and good governance models. I intend to bring those as supervisors with the same enthusiasm I did as sheriff. And I think together we're gonna solve these big challenges that we're, they were facing, but it's not gonna happen with the status quo. So please reach out, family, friends everywhere. Let's make a difference, let's get involved. Let's send those career politicians home. My name is Alex Villanueva and I'm running for the Board of Supervisors. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, let me thank both of our candidates. Wasn't that informative? Let's have another round of applause. I want to thank our, our moderator, Glenn Cornell. Uh, and, and Jack and Art, and who are down in front and, and keeping everybody on time, I uh, would encourage the candidates to stay around. If you didn't get your question asked, uh, hopefully the candidates will stay. We've got maybe some cookies left in the back. For the uh, CHOA members, just be aware that our next meeting has been moved from February to March, and we'll be sending out a notice about the March 20th annual board meeting. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening.